So Josh, welcome to Coffee with a Googler. Thank you, thanks for having me. Now, you work on something called the Distributions API and that brings about probabilistic programming. What's that all about? Yeah, so this is uh, something that uh, myself and my team were really excited about. So uh, I think a little history is in order. So mm -hmm. TensorFlow um, did a, a number of amazing things. Um, maybe one of the most amazing is how they made uh, training uh, deep neural nets easy, yeah. or relatively easy. Yeah. And it's a lot uh, easier than it used to it's be. It's a lot easier <laughs> than it used to be. And this has resulted in a flurry of research and exciting results and uh, um, you know, solving problems that otherwise seemed impossible or at least very difficult to solve. Right. So before neural nets were all the hotness, uh, many machine learning folks, including myself, um, sort of consider ourselves probabilistic machine learning okay. um, as like a specialization. And we want to be a part of the new hotness. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? Who doesn't? I got the logo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where distributions enters the story. We think that um, TensorFlow doesn't have to be just a language for fitting neural nets. It mm -hmm. can be a language for statisticians. It can be a language for doing probability-first machine learning, for fusing neural nets with sort of older ideas and getting something that's greater than the sum of its parts. So distributions is a tiny Lego piece that tries to make that just a little bit easier. Now, I noticed you recently published a paper on the distributions API explaining what it's all about. Could you could you give us the brief summary? Yeah, so we wrote um, just a white paper sort of showing all of the cool things that can be done when you mix TensorFlow intrinsics and mm -hmm. this distributions API. It's actually pretty simple, um, but what I think the real power comes from the breadth of the API in terms of the number of distributions that are um, included, as well as the way they sort of plug and play with TensorFlow workflows, cool. let's call it. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I first started seeing something called a distributions API, I was like, hey, cool, something I can use to distribute my models. But <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should have renamed it. <laughs> yeah, shall we start refactoring? Yeah, let's. Uh, if you want to refactor, by all means. Uh, it's it's going to be a bit of work, yeah. Uh, but so, but it's not about distributing apps, right? It's so. not about distributing apps. No, it's about uh, encoding properties of random variables in easy to use in an easy to use framework. Um, so uh, a random variable is a way to represent uncertainty, let's say, mm -hmm. and there are several useful properties that it has. You may ask, what's the average under this random variable? You may ask, what's the variance under this random variable? So distribution just collects these properties. That's not super exciting. I think what's slightly more exciting is the way we organize the library automatically takes advantage of modern hardware. Okay. So we have something we call batch semantics, which is a TensorFlow idea. And uh, it means that you can parameterize one distribution in many different ways and take advantage of SIMD instructions. Right. So I, I noticed in your paper you spoke a little bit about distributions, but you also mentioned these things called bijectors. Right. And that's a fabulous name, but what exactly is a bijector? Yeah. So we actually named it a bijector, so that way uh, if you Google searched for it, you would only find that word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bijector is a very simple idea. It is a function of a tensor. Okay. Uh, and where this fits into the distribution API is presumably that tensor is itself a sample from some distribution. So a bijector is a way of transforming one distribution into another distribution. Okay. That's useful because if we didn't have that concept, we have like 60 distributions now. We may have 600 distributions if we tried to implement all transformations of all distributions. Right. There's something called a log normal, which is e to the normal distribution, let's say. Okay. And we don't actually implement that as a first class citizen. To achieve that, you would transform a Gaussian distribution with the exponential bijector. And okay. now you have log normal. I see. So it's a way that you can combine and chop and change distributions. Exactly. And yeah. Exactly. Okay. The idea is distributions are sources of stochasticity or mm -hmm. randomness, and bijectors are deterministic transformations of those sources of randomness. Okay. So there's a kind of dichotomy there. Interesting. So just taking a step back for a second from and just think, why is probabilistic programming, in your view, why is it necessary? And what, what, what does it bring to the table for developers? Yeah, that's an exciting question. So I like to think of probabilistic programming as being a Formalism for reasoning under uncertainty. Okay. I like that definition because I can't think of something that doesn't fit into that <laughs> definition. <laughs> Those are the best definitions. Those are the best definitions. Yeah. Science is uh, 
you make a hypothesis, you verify that hypothesis with some empirical study. But we might imagine that the third time you ran your experiment, you got a totally mm -hmm. different result. It doesn't mean your hypothesis is wrong, it just means that, guess what? Nature has randomness. Mm -hmm. So having a, a way to make it easy to specify uncertainty and to perform inference and reasoning on it means that you can sort of tease out the signal from the noise. Okay. And doing so in a formal way keeps you honest. Right. It means that you can't claim, I have a cure for cancer, when in fact it works only one out of a million. Got it, got it. And also for safety reasons, right? If you're doing something like, absolutely. this is a green light. It, absolutely, suppose you, have a, suppose you have a machine learning algorithm trying to detect if it's a green light. Mm -hmm. If you were only 2% sure that it's a green light, you probably should stop. <laughs> exactly. Or don't go. Don't go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then like, if it's 97% or if it's 98%, so that's the question. That's like, you you, like The nice thing about having some notion of uncertainty in your predictive system is you can weigh the opportunity cost of action or inaction. Mm -hmm. And it, it might seem like a lot of this is very theoretical and very mathematical, but it's also very concrete, right? As soon as you build your first neural network, as soon as you build a neuron, you know, that's entirely based on probability. Yeah, it's interesting you say it's theoretical because machine learning likes to boil things down to accuracy. Mm. I have some algorithm and it achieves 97% accuracy on detecting handwritten digits. That's not how the real world actually works. The whole point of having a machine learned model is you're going to make some choice. Mm. And so I think it's immensely practical to have a system that tells you, look, this is the choice I think you should make, but this is how much you should trust me. <laughs> okay. That seems like actually not theoretical. That seems like what we all really want or maybe even need. Mm. And so if you take a probabilistic first viewpoint, you can start to design systems that have this capability. Right, and, and to be able to get that probability, you need like things like loss functions and you plug a distribution into that. So by having tons of distributions, exactly. it gives you the ability exactly. to chop and change to see what works best exactly. for you. Exactly, and not just tons of distributions, but ways to change them while preserving the computational properties. Right. Uh, and that's the bijectors. And that's the bijector, exactly. Right. Cool, so um, say I'm getting started in machine learning and you know, even getting started in machine learning is a hard enough thing, but what advice would you give me to be able to optimize what I'm doing? What, any good pointers that you would yeah, have from your Yeah, background? so uh, I do not have neural network as a background, um, but I like to think of neural nets, although this may be heretical, as very fancy forms of regression. Mm -hmm. Regression is a relatively old, or actually an old idea in statistics and relatively old in machine learning, in which you try to predict uh, a response given some evidence. Mm -hmm. That's what a neural net does too. So I think to get started, we have this thing called trainable distributions, which basically take a tensor that is your evidence, and it gives you back a distribution from which you could plug in, say, minus distribution.logprob of your labels as a loss into an optimizer. Cool. So um, it, you know, the, the examples we have there show just how easy it is to do regression in TensorFlow. And the nice part about that is as you add more sophistication, different layers in TensorFlow parlance with different activations, nonlinear functions of the output of those layers, mm -hmm. now you can get state-of-the-art machine learning sophistication. Cool, cool. And obviously, if I'm going beyond beginning and I want to start getting into distributions, what, I mean, I guess read your paper would be good advice. Yeah, right? so the white paper has a lot of examples that show um, just the power of this really simple idea. Um, and those are my favorite kinds of ideas because I actually get them. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the best kind. That's right? the best kind of idea. No point having an idea that nobody understands, Especially right? me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Josh. This has been so much fun. And it's like really, really digging down into stuff that I formerly really didn't understand. But having read your paper and having played with some of this stuff, I can really begin to see where this is I'm going. I'm happy so, to hear that. So thanks very much, Josh. That was fascinating. And thank you, too, for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. If you have any questions for me or if you have any questions for Josh, please leave them in the comments below. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Oh, and by the way, be sure to check out our brand new TensorFlow channel on YouTube. Thank you.